I welcome you all. And uh, we would, the panel style is question and answer, again, similar to what yours was doing. Is this, does this mic work? Yeah, it does. It's a Q&A style of uh, questioning. And again, no monologues, but whenever you, need, you feel like you have a question, please do raise your hands. And I don't know who will get you the mic. Ahmed is not here. I will get you the mic. <laughs> Somebody can probably get Ahmed and the mic for me, please. Yeah. So uh, first, we'll start with the macro question, which is directed at you. Uh, and then everyone else would sort of contribute to that. And the next part will deal with human rights, which is mainly you guys. So everyday journalists, analysts, and experts working in the context of Iran face a bulk of headlines, including factional disputes between key political figures, parties, nuclear agreement, electoral alliances, antagonisms, issues related to freedom of expression, environmental concerns, particularly the water crisis. Issues regarding minorities, women. I want, to, I want you to weigh in on this news and tell me, for the next year to come, what would you think would be representative of Iranian domestic politics? What would be decisive? What would be important or significant to define if you want to project the next year to come? There are mics around here as well. It works, I think, yeah. First of all, thank you for having me. Uh, considering all those issues that you mentioned, but I've, if I want to say something that there are two main challenges or issues for uh, Iranian domestic politics is that, first of all, I think the clash between two groups uh, that we can call it two wings of Islamic Republic is something that affecting all other issues, all governing issues in Iran. We know that nowadays we call the two main uh, political forces inside Iran that we know as the, uh, let's say, uh, normally they consider the conservatives and the moderates, or in political term we can call them the hardliner and the softliner. And there are some similarity between these two. Uh, for instance, they both have the main concern of the survival of Islamic Republic, a kind of electoral theocracy that in this system they can be part of the political power in Iran. There are some other similarities like what they think about the separation of a state and church. They don't believe in political secularism. And also there are some similarity even in the, in the policy regard, for instance, regional aggression. They both support Assad. They both support the Iranian intervention in the region. But on the other hand, there is some real differences between these two. For instance, and I, and I can say that there are two different models that they have. In, the, in, in mind, and so uh, hardliner think of the model of North Korea, but softliner think of the model of China for governing the country. Hardliner thinks that if they go in the direction of North Korea, then they can be sure that the survival of regime will somehow get guaranteed. But on the other hand, softliner thinks that no, it doesn't work, and maybe we should go towards the Chinese model. We should go for a kind of uh, economic growth, to normalization of the relation with the West. And in this way, without any uh, serious concern about human rights, democratic, uh, uh, political de de democracy, and other things, exactly like the model of China. And that's a kind of clash between these two attitudes. And this is a real clash that can affect everything. Because, uh, and still, this is a kind of ongoing clash. We don't know that what will be the final uh, uh, winner or final compromise between these two. That's another thing that we can discuss if, uh, if, we, if we have time. But this is the kind of one challenge inside the Iranian politics, the clash between these two. But I want to say that there is another challenge. There is a second issue, which is about the, that maybe international community and ex external observers normally see these two groups and they think that all people of the of, uh, Iranian people somehow support this or that. And I want to mention that beyond this hardliner, softliner, we have another group, another part of people in Iran that I can call it, that's a, the word that I coined, that they are outliner, which are they're out of these two hardliner and softliner. And I can claim, based on my uh, 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 
uh, empirical analysis on the election results in over past years, a kind of longitudinal analysis I did, that softliner and hardliner in Iran have, each of them have 25% at the maximum, 25% of voters uh, as a kind of supporter. But we have another 50% of society and a bit more that they are not belong to any of these two. They don't support, they don't vote even for them, although uh, sometimes we see that this, among these 50%, some people vote for softliner because between bad and worse, they think that it's better to support bad. But we have the problem that international community nowadays, they don't see these outliners. And these outliners in turn divided to two main, I think, political forces that I call them change seeker and regime change seeker. Those who think that we should have change, we need to abolish that penalty, we need to uh, improve the uh, uh, women's right, we need to uh, have democratic elections, and there, there is no main concern that we have this regime or not. They are not against regime change, but it's not their first mm -hmm. priority to have regime change. And we have regime change uh, seeker who thinks that we should first think of changing regime, after that we can go for the changes. And that's the problem that international community nowadays, and if you see that all, the, the, the former uh, panel also, that they think that there is just the kind of issue that we should work with softliner, and if there is something that to go to the model of China, why not? Because China is good. China is a good partner for economy. China is a good partner uh, for, uh, for, for having relation. But the problem is that many people, many activists, pro-democracy activists, human rights defenders, civil rights activists, they, they belong to this 50% that I call outliner. They are change seeker, or some part are also regime change seeker. And the problem is that they are ignored. Nowadays, they think that we have just this dichotomy of softliner or hardliner, conservative and moderate. But I want to say that there is another group that the challenge is that, and we are, many of us are somehow think that we belong to the change seeker, and that's, that's, that's a challenge, because without this, there are a lot of issues, with, I think, for the future of Iran. If you can, we can elaborate later. Yeah, but we have to get back to what you think would be decisive in the year to come. You know, I really want that to be answered during this panel, but for the time being, do you, Raha, agree with, uh, with Ammar that these uh, divisions, because it does uh, really reflect what you do in the human rights, because these fights, these factionalisms between reformists and then hardliners and then also Sepah, the Revolutionary Guard there as a factor, uh, has real implications for civil society activists and for uh, minority groups, people that you care about. What do you think is decisive and how will it be related to what uh, Ammar was saying for even in, you know, in Iranian politics and the factionalism that exists. Mm -hmm. uh, as uh, human rights activists and uh, human rights uh, defenders, uh, we uh, always uh, hold the Iranian state responsible for the violation of human rights that uh, they commit because after all, when they b appear before international bodies, it's the state that is responsible uh, for violating its obligations under international law. Of course, from a realistic perspective, we need to be aware of the perpetrators and the fact that they belong to different uh, sections or political divisions that Ammar was mentioning in his uh, comments. And uh, we see that some of them bear more direct responsibility than others. Unfortunately, when it comes to the issue of human rights, though, as the earlier comments also mentioned, we do not see even the so-called moderates taking any meaningful steps about the human rights violations that are perpetrated by the Iranian judiciary and intelligence and security forces, uh, mainly the, uh, the intelligence unit of the Revolutionary Guards and the Ministry of Intelligence. Uh, unfortunately, on some instances, we have even seen the executive uh, taking positions that actively endorse the human rights violations that happen in the country. For example, the foreign uh, minister has uh, stated on a number of occasions that uh, the Europeans should be thankful about 
uh, Iran's uh, execution of uh, drug offenders because uh, Iran is preventing the flow of drugs into Europe. Or when it comes to political prisoners, uh, uh, he um, mentions in his media interviews that uh, one, the judiciary is independent. That is always his first answer. When they are fully aware that the judiciary is the state's arm in uh, implementing ruthless repressive policies. And second, uh, they say their cases relate to national security offenses and they will be dealt with properly so they do not want to interrupt the course of justice taking its uh, its course, and uh, in that way, they are basically uh, ignoring uh, bodies of evidence that individuals, uh, scores of individuals, uh, are being targeted simply for exercising their uh, human rights in a peaceful manner. And um, going to your question about the trends that will be decisive, I think uh, one trend that is uh, increasingly emerging, uh, and we've documented that in the past two years, is the intensification of crackdown on human rights activists and human rights defenders. And that is a very key concern, because human rights defenders are crucial agents of change. Uh, they take injustice personally, and they act out against it. And they must be allowed and encouraged to uh, act without um, harassment and without fear of reprisal. And uh, what we are seeing is that the space for um, the space in which the human rights defenders act uh, is shrinking rapidly, and they are receiving harsh sentences. Um, revolutionary courts uh, are not showing away at all from uh, mentioning a specific human rights activities as evidence of criminal activity, and we are increasingly seeing peaceful human rights activities like. Uh, campaigning for the abolition of the death penalty or communicating with international human rights organizations or having solidarity with families of political prisoners mentioned as evidence of criminal activity in court verdicts. This is a new trend uh, because it shows the extent to which they are, um, they are, um, and they have no shame in basically criminalizing human rights activity to the point that they mention it so explicitly in court documents. Um, and it's uh, an issue that requires uh, more attention in the months to come. And this is something that Amnesty will focus on as part of its global campaign on human rights defenders. So I want to talk about the fact that there was hopes that if the talks with the West will go well, it will have a positive impact on the situation of civil society and human rights in Iran. In the, in the year to come, do you think these negotiations, the dialogues that we've talked about uh, this whole year, the you know, working towards less isolation of, this, of Iran internationally, but we want to talk about the, what are the domestic implications of that, does it? Do you think that, uh, from your experiences, you know, working with the civil society and you know other organizations, it will have a positive impact. Um, thanks, but just if you uh, can let me, I would like to just Definitely, finish on that. Please, go ahead. Um, so, just going back of what Amar was saying about the political fractions and and some of the the fact that the human rights situations remain mm -hmm. no matter whether we're dealing with the moderates or the hardliners or the outliers. And also going back to your question of what are going to be some of the trends in, in light of the elections. Unfortunately, I think that um, what happens given those fractions is that only when these fractions start to fight about a topic is that when it becomes a national trend. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for instance, economic mismanagement and corruption um, is now in the in the national press and everything because suddenly you know the hardliners are picking on the moderates because the well the so-called moderates because the moderates picked on the sapa and and so you know you kind of have to rely on their fights to be able to hope that something will surface that three years ago would have not surfaced in that same exact way um, and and you know I mean for instance water crisis is so imminent but it's never going to receive the kind of attention of the national uh, media that that you would you would like it to see because there is accountability on uh, and basically on hold um, so uh, as much as we celebrate and we should celebrate you know platforms like radio Zaman and, and the internet unfortunately the power still relies with states media and and what they choose to 
to show, and we, we really have to hope that these fractions start to fight about women's rights, about the environment, about yes. ethnic rights, and then maybe they will become trends. Um, about your question, um, I think that uh, given well, the implementation of, of the outcome of the negotiations that's going to happen in, in the next year and sort of Iran opening up in some way or the other um, economically, of course, is a chance for, uh, for us as a civil society, as human rights advocates, to, to um, raise our demands and, and to be very specific about what we want. Um, I, think, I think that... Um, the situation is not going to get better, as we have seen in the past few months, without us working very hard and working with, a, with different strategies towards continuously raising our, our um, demands. And, but also sort of looking at it, again, coming from a public policy background, I think incentivizing um, whoever you're, you're talking at or talking to, de making demands is, is very important. The more o Iran is going to open up, the more this incentivization aspect is going to become important to companies, pressuring companies. Ms. Abadi was just talking about um, it. To um, countries, the European Union is a great example. I mean, um, we as human rights um, community and human rights advocates, uh, civil society, we of course don't look at human rights as something that we can compromise on any level. Um, knowing that, we still have to think about well, what is in it for the European Union to, to go into the meetings and, and have a particular demand on the side about human rights. What kind of demand? How can they formulate it? And, and so I think it's very important that we as a community start to become more specific and more um, sort of with short term, medium term, longer term goals in mind and then go after it that way. So our challenge is going to be harder. Yeah, so you know, she wants specific goals. And I want to go back to you on Sepah, which is the Revolutionary Guards, and its ambitions economically, militaristically, politically. It affects human rights because it has its own intelligence agency, which arrests people regularly. Do you think Sepah will be decisive in the next year to come? And how do you think it would play domestically as it pertains to issues of human rights as well, but we'll go back to Raha and uh, Ozada for that. Yeah, as I said, that I think the SEPA is one of the parts of those uh, uh, hardliners who thinks that we should go towards the uh, model of North Korea somehow. That they said that, okay, we should, even by regarding nuclear issue, there are, it's, it's not enough evidence to reject or to prove that they want to have a nuclear bomb, but... Uh, they think that the, if they want to have a kind of guarantee for the kind of uh, the, the, the missions that SEPA uh, uh, defined for themselves, that, uh, that uh, we uh, have a kind of regional aggressiveness, we want, they want to somehow take different parts of the uh, uh, region as we see that what they did in Syria, what they are, uh, what did in Iraq. Uh, and on the other hand, they think that the, 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 the inside the country, those who are in power, those are who are from the semi-elected uh, uh, positions like the president, like the parliament, they think that they should control that who is in power there. And that's why we see nowadays there are something about uh, the second round of Rouhani that maybe uh, he should not be there. He, he's going to give the country to the West or something. But I and have a question. People keep saying that, that the SEPA is part of the hardliners. And, but they're also invested in economic relations with the West and with the Western countries. Why, what, why do you think that uh, they are after a North Korean model and not a China model? Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. their intelligence community keeps uh, suppressing civil society, uh, but their economic factions are also at play. So uh, do you think that faction, which is invested in their networks and trades with the outside world, will have an effect in the year to come? Yeah, that's, I think, the kind of compromise that the softliner can somehow uh, uh, persuade SEPA that if we go to the model of China, you also benefit. It's something, I think, it's a kind of ongoing discussion. Because SEPA, those parts that's a hardliner, thinks that if they go towards the Chinese model, then the end, they, they, don't, uh, they don't end up to the Chinese model, but they will end up to the Soviet Union model. And that's, that's the main concern. And maybe they are right. I think that's because there are a lot of issues when we want to say that can we have a China model in Iran or not? 
I guess also, yeah, there are a lot of, in fact, uh, the, the elements that you can see that maybe the final result will be what we see from the, 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 in the Soviet Union and not the China. And that, that, that's the kind of thing. On the other hand, they are somehow pessimistic about having a, normal, having a kind of normalized relation with the West, even economically. They think that it's somehow affect the uh, culture, kind of human rights, there are a lot of things. And also this is something that we see Supreme Leader always said that I'm very pessimistic mm -hmm. because they uh, say something about the economy, but they want to affect culture, they want to, affect, they, they want to somehow say something about human rights. And this is something that they have a concern. Okay. Uh, if you so think in a kind of very logically yeah. way, if Sapa think in a logical way, for sure it's good for them to go towards the mm -hmm. Chinese model. Right. But the issue is that what we, we saw recently, that there are some kind of international uh, organizations demand for kind of uh, uh, removing those uh, who are, have a kind of terrorist ties uh, with, for, uh, from the economy. And that's why we see uh, recently the kind of the, the discussion about the treaty, the treaty that Iran, Iranian governments accepted to uh, mm -hmm. somehow control uh, surpass uh, investment. And the, these are uh, the kind of issues and concern for SEPA. And that's why they cannot accept even going to our Chinese model, which uh, I think Rohani's uh, the, 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 the government and Softliner wants to go uh, to that direction. <laughs> So Raha, you know, in the next year to come, uh, aside from the Sepah, we have the issue of succession. There's always, there's always this uh, concern that uh, Ayatollah Khamenei might die, you know, and somebody has to replace him, and these factions are going to fight for it really hard. Uh, as a human rights advocate, are you really concerned that the refashioning of the politics in Iran will have an effect on your work in the next year to come? Uh, I think uh, it is a bit uh, speculative for us mm. to uh, think about uh, uh, how that reshuffling will happen and in what ways we should revise our strategies in light of that. I think uh, at the moment uh, there are certain trends that we believe will continue based on what we've seen. The, uh, the intelligence and security forces uh, who, uh, who arrest um, peaceful critics and others, and the revolutionary course uh, and the Office of Prosecution, uh, which basically take their instructions from the intelligence and security forces in carrying out their repressive policies. Um, so when it comes to um, the freedom of expression and association issues, uh, I believe that trends would not massively change unless um, because of the kind of uh, changes that you mentioned, we suddenly see um, unexpected events in the country that may either lead to uh, new opportunities or put us in a crisis situation that uh, that would be uh, similar like to 2009, uh, that massively change uh, the way amnesty needed to work because the scale of the problem suddenly uh, changed. Um, Right. So Azadeh, I'm going to move back to our second part as we discussed. And uh, human rights groups, as we, it's always in Iranian politics, macro politics, always somehow, uh, as it does in this session so far, uh, covers everything. And we never talk about uh, the little fish in the business, you know. So I want to talk to you about... Uh, there are various violations of rights that takes place in Iran, including the rights of refugees, Afghan refugees, the right to have health care, the right to poverty, the right of ethnic minorities, the right of LGBTs. These are usually sidelined in the mainstream rhetoric of human rights in Iran. If you want to reorient uh, and refashion uh, the process of documentations of violations, how would you look at it and how would you change it? Um, yeah, that's, I think it's an important and interesting question. Um, when you sent me that question, I actually went in and talked to a few colleagues who I thought come from different sort of um, schools of thoughts, if you will, about that. And that uh, set of few interviews by itself was very revealing to me because you know, some of them were saying we have to depoliticize human rights and we should not talk as much as we do about things like death penalty, minority rights, because we have, you know, environment to take care of. We have, uh, you know, children's rights and street children and education to figure out. So there was this kind of a tension between 
um, human rights as they saw it as political versus development, uh, human rights as it gets into development. Um, and then others um, were still concerned that, well, I mean, we have to actually talk a lot more about death penalty, about minority rights, about, um, uh, you know, various issues that may sound political and may be show us showing our dirty laundry in lieu of the nuclear deals to the world, but, well, we have to do it. Um, so I think that, um, th for me, the biggest thing is not to look at these issues as competing with each other um, and not to set an agenda for the other groups. I mean, if you are somebody who, uh, who is working on, on environmental rights, I think um, it's okay if another group is working on death penalty and the rights of the Kurds and the Azeris. These things should, so I think we should really try to think about what our definition as, as a society is of human rights and whether that really um, aligns with the international definition and how we can uh, sort of situate ourselves as, as the world is also looking at us define our problems more elaborately. Um, and also to give, and also one more thing is that, um, two more things, one is that I think we should look at the problems from different angles. So just to give an example, let's look at sort of the, um, the um, multiple, uh, Sort of the issue of landmine injuries is a problem, especially in the Kurdish areas of Iran. Now, you can look at it from the landmine perspective and look at, for instance, Iran is not part of the treaty to ban mines. Um, you can also look at and, and you can also look at it from another perspective and, and see that Iran is a signatory to the, child, uh, the Rights of the Child Convention. And so you can go, for instance, you can, while you say that Iran should become a signatory, but you can also go through, go at it at a route of a children's rights perspective. And, and use UN mechanisms and have a, find a way to actually directly hold, hold Iranian decision makers accountable, especially for those of us abroad, we have a way to directly hold Iranian decision makers coming to Geneva, coming to New York accountable, and we should really learn and use those mechanisms. So I think when, when we focus our problems about how can we document things that human rights violations that are legitimate um, to the international community, then we can really use the mechanisms that exist. So. All right. uh, I'd like you to add to what Azadeh had to say because you have personal experience working uh, with Dr. Shahid mm -hmm. and uh, with your own research. The challenges you face for instance, for LGBT rights to be included, you know, in the mm -hmm. reports, because LGBT rights was only included in one of the, or two of the reports, you know, and not all the other reports that Dr. Shahid produced. And part of it is also about how the domestic politics in Iran relates to the international bodies that are pushing for human rights. And this, how do these two interact and weigh in into what to include in the mainstream rhetoric of you, you know, I'd like you to add to that, add to that, and s tell me what are the challenges and how can we include those who are in the peripheries, both geographically and symbolically, those who are the ethnic minorities living in the peripheries of Iran, but also those who are invisible, who don't get included. Mm -hmm. uh, if, um, if it's okay, I will first go back to the issue of those sure. living in poverty and the issue of social and economic yeah. rights, and then I move on to discuss sure. the situation of uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. Um, the issues are, that um, we were talking about, they are known in international law as uh, violations of social, economic, and cultural rights. And these include the right to uh, work, the right to education, including compulsory and primary education, the right to the highest attainable of physical and mental health, the right and the rights to uh, food, sanitation, water, and housing. These rights are guaranteed under the International Covenant on, CV on Economic, Cultural, and um, on economic, social, and cultural rights, which Iran has ratified. Uh, and uh, these are not just policy issues that the government can decide about. They are international obligations that the authorities have to comply with. Uh, unfortunately, in reality, uh, there, uh, there is gross uh, social and economic inequality in many countries, including Iran. And even though at the time of adopting the International Declaration of Human Rights, the international community recognized that uh, freedom from want and fear, which they 
used in order to address socioeconomic issues and freedom of speech and belief are interconnected and both of them need to be secured in order for all people to enjoy all human rights. We saw that for several decades, these uh, rights were sidelined. Um, this is not the case anymore. Uh, since the end of the Cold War, the issue of socioeconomic rights has been acknowledged. And at Amnesty since 2001, uh, the issue has been part of the mandate. And there has been a global campaign on living in dignity. And the indivisibility of human rights has been acknowledged. Unfortunately, when it comes to Iran, as um, you rightly mentioned, uh, neither Amnesty nor the broader Iranian human rights community have been able to tackle poverty-related issues as human rights violations. Um, I, I can only speak for amnesty. I think for us, the main challenge is lack of capacity and um, the largest scale violations of civil and political rights that stretch us to our absolute limits. Um, uh, but that doesn't justify not working on uh, these issues. And there is, there remains a lack for, an, for a dedicated, at least one dedicated human rights organization in the Iranian community working solely on social and economic issues. I think for organizations working from outside Iran, lack of access is also a key factor because you need more access to the ground when you document violations of social and economic rights, more so than when you need I think uh, some civil and common civil and political rights issues. Um, recognizing all these challenges, I'd just like to mention some work that has been done. Um, so you mentioned the special rapporteur. Uh, he included uh, a section on environment in his uh, August 2015 report, I think, um, which mentioned the drying of Lake Urumie, uh, the increased number of sandstorms and dust storms, uh, and um, and the high uh, air pollution levels. Then there is this seminal report uh, from 2006 that the special rapporteur on the right to housing did. And he traveled to Iran at the time in July 2006. And this report um, is an amazing analysis of the right to housing. It may not be relevant because there have been many developments. But at the time, it was a very important report that shed light on how violations of um, ethnic minority rights in the area of civil and political rights are completely interconnected with the entrenched poverty and the economic neglect of um, uh, minority populated regions. She also issued discrimination against, she also addressed discrimination against women and how that manifests itself in the right to housing. Um, then there is <coughs> the reports that Human Rights Watch did on um, Iran's violations of Afghan uh, and re uh, refugee and migrants rights. And at Amnesty, we've done uh, two reports in recent years on the right to health. One is the denial of medical care in Iran's prisons. And the other one is um, the authorities' attacks on women's rights to sexual and reproductive health. So there have been these uh, reports or short uh, briefings here and there. But they have not been put together and expanded uh, and raised uh, on a sustained basis. All right. Um, so at this point, uh, we'd like to, oh, so many questions. Hello. So uh, let's start uh, with you. We'll move here. We'll go anti-clockwise. Okay. Uh, but please avoid monologues, uh, because we want to be really quick. So over there, please. Um, I've missed one issue, and that's the epidemic um, corruption by the state officials. I think that's the biggest domestic issue. I think Azadeh did <laughs> mention that, actually. What is, yeah. your, what is your vision on that? So, yeah, Azadeh, you mentioned about the fact that uh, in the past year, she did mention that in the past year, uh, economic corruption has become really mainstream issue, and she anticipated it would be a trend. But why don't you add into that the fact that there is the, there's all these... Uh, 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 new cases of uh, revealing of the corruption in mass scale and people responding to it. Yeah, just uh, I want to mention something that when we talk about corruption and controlling corruption, this is one of the pre-requirements for having good governance. And that's also, I think, a challenge for a uh, softliner in Iran or moderates if they want to go to the Chinese model or those, uh, those models that they have good governance without democracy. Because we know that nowadays we have two models. 
We can have good governance, we can have democratic system. And there is no, no strong correlation between this, let's say. There is a kind of a correlation. For instance, I can say that Singapore have a very good governance without democracy. Singapore is among the uh, 10 least corrupted countries in the world, but for, for democracy, I think it's one of the, uh, the, the, at, the at the end of the, uh, the, the, the ranking. And also China is, the problem in China nowadays is corruption. It's kind of recent years. But they could somehow do good job in controlling corruption, specifically in, for economic growth. And this is the issue for Iran. And that's why I think kind of a problem. And that's why I think Rouhani started to have that treaty to somehow control Sepa not uh, having a kind of connection with those, uh, the, the, the uh, terrorists, uh, uh, the, the, the money uh, uh, washing those things. So corruption is the main problem for good governance. But uh, that, that's a part of challenge. And I think that that's what I mentioned, that there is a kind of challenge between two models. I think those who wants to go towards Chinese model to have good governance without democracy, the main issue for them is corruption. And I think that's something we see that Rouhani and the government uh, mentioned a lot, although we see that the problem is that in softliners, there are many corrupted people, as recently there was kind of this that, uh, about the, the income uh, uh, bills, uh, the, the those, in fact, uh, uh, crisis. So the problem with corruption is in both sides. So, but this has also social justice concerns because the corruption, the fact that a lot of this is coming in the news and people are reacting to it. Do you think you can tie that, uh, the mass corruption, to the fact that uh, people do not have public health care in Iran, uh, the issue of poverty, issues of social justice? Um, how would you respond to that? Uh, definitely, if there were the resources, uh, mm -hmm. I think it is possible to do very uh, strong human rights reports in this area. Uh, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the government has the obligation under international law to dedicate its resources to ensure that people at least have minimum levels of mm -hmm. Uh, food, primary access to primary education, housing, and sanitation, and that's just the minimum. Then they have the progress; they have the obligation to progressively realize uh, the fulfillment of social, economic, and cultural rights. So there is a core obligation that they must, uh, regardless of their resources issue, they must comply with, which they don't in many regions of the country. And then on top of that, they must show that they are prioritizing their uh, budgeting. Um, allocations in a way that the interests of the poor uh, are put um, above other matters. And uh, I think if you were going to do a proper research, we haven't done that at Amnesty, so I can't, I'm just mentioning these areas of analysis, I can't come up with like serious allegations because we haven't done the research. But I think based on the news that we see, it is possible to show how the government is failing to respect and protect um, social economic rights and then Definitely, they are not fulfilling if you see at the budgetary allocations. Uh, but as I said, we need a, a human rights organization that can dedicate itself to documentation of social and economic rights. And we do not have that at the moment in the Iranian community. And organizations like Amnesty are expected to work on violations of civil and political rights because of their legacy. and. Um, if we can have formal researchers, we okay. can document. We have budget issues. <laughs> so please go ahead. Yeah. I have a question about the outliners. Um, what is your take that those outliners will become inliners, meaning that they will become, uh, that they will shape a political voice and that they will be part of the political process? And another thing related to that is we have been talking so long for that the youth will be the agents of change. So long that they are now retired. So um, what is your take on who are now the agents of change? Are they the youth who are chasing Pokemons in the streets? Um, because the youth of these days inside Iran, maybe they don't have the same kind of uh, ideals that so you might have had in the, in the beginning. From there, if, if it's okay. So we're trying to keep Just a second. Very short. How much do I have? Five? Almost. Oh, comma. One. one. In one minute, who is the agent of change? Is it Revolutionary Guard or the youth? <laughs> or if you I want to I thought that I should talk about outliners, but 
Yeah, the problem is that outliners in Iran are suppressed, and that's, that's the issue. And that's why I want to mention that they need to somehow uh, be supported, at least from the international community. When I talk about outliners, those uh, change seeker, I talk about many people that we know. There are many, in fact, distinguished figures. I, I can see that, for instance, Shirin Abadi is a change seeker. Nasrin Sutu, the Nargis Mohammadi, those who are in Iran, who are the main human rights defender, civil rights uh, supporter, those are, uh, I think, among outliners. And what they can do, they cannot be part of politics in Iran when we see there is no democratic change. But at least we can see that we can, we can say that if we want to say something about the international community, external observers, that these parts should be supported. And, uh, and you should not ignore it because you want to have a kind of economic ties. Okay, for that's, 30 that's seconds. That's what we can 30 say. Second. 30 seconds also to finish it. Yeah, so I, I think that we should sort of move away from expecting the masses of people, whether they're youth or women or whatever, that they have the most burden on to be the change seekers. And we should really look at it from a micro level. And it's really the time has come to start reading a lot more about what's happening inside Iran and looking at civil society in its informal sense. There are many groups you and I have never heard about. Maybe they don't even have names. They organically get together. They boycott public hangings, even in one of the, some of the most dangerous provinces in Iran. There are many groups who uh, uh, try to push the envelope and uh, to the edge with women's rights, but they're not the ones you and I hear about with LGBT rights. We don't hear about them. So we should really look for small micro groups of citizens who are active, but not necessarily in our radar. Can I just add something? <laughs> when it comes to human rights, panels never end. Okay. I just wanted to um, mention the names of some of the young generation of human rights activists who are paying a huge price for their human rights activism. So we have the older generation that Ammar mentioned, who Ammar mentioned, but we have Atena Daimi, uh, Arash Sadiqi, Saeed Hossein Zadeh, and um, Omid Ali uh, Shanaz. And these are young people who have not been sentenced to very harsh prison sentences from seven to 12 years. And many of their cases are under appeal. And if this young generation is sent into prison, basically the authorities are stamping out a new generation of human rights defenders who are as young as 21 and no, not older than like 33. And they are facing pr uh, prison sentences up to a decade. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you, our presenters. I present you with flowers.